Hi, I'm Sheila McManus. I'm one of the Board of Governors teaching chairs at the University of Lethbridge. Thank you for joining me for another Ed Talk. I'm talking to Abigail McMeekin, who's an instructor of Japanese mm -hmm. in the Modern Languages Department. Thanks for coming to talk to me today, Abigail. Thanks for inviting me. So the main reason why I wanted to talk to you today is you're one of the winners of this year's Student Union Teaching Awards, which are actually really great awards on campus because you have to be nominated by the students. Right. Um, and then it's handed out by the Students' Union. Uh, so three instructors a year win, and you are one of this year's instructors. Um, tell me a little bit about your teaching career. How do you think you got to this moment? I was a PhD student at the University of Hawaii. And part of that program is that we get to be graduate assistants. Here you call them teaching assistants. So um, the only difference, and I'm not 100% sure if there is a huge difference, but you are responsible for one class. Nice. And essentially after about a semester of, you know, kind of showing you the ropes, you get in there and you just start teaching. They basically throw you in the water and you sink or swim. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for the classic model of educating graduate student right, teachers. <laughs> right. You just figure it out as you go. And to some extent, that is exactly the way everything is. You start at ground zero and you sort of work your way up to knowing what you're doing. Um, and what you really have to do is sort of suspend that judgment of yourself as not being good enough because I think that's true, then obviously yeah. you're just afraid to go into the classroom. But <laughs> when I think very quickly, being a learner of Japanese, I knew what worked for me, right? So what I did then was just try to translate everything that I had learned as a learner and how to learn Japanese into my teaching. How can I make it easier? What kind of strategies did I use? And I just focused on teaching those to the students. Mm -hmm. And so I think the strongest thing I have going for me, since I'm not a native speaker of Japanese, is that I had to learn it from ground zero mm -hmm. exactly the way my students have to. And I have a really strong memory of how difficult it was. <laughs> and then what I did to sort of overcome those difficulties. Right. Um, because all of my teachers were native speakers. And so asking them for strategies and tips and tricks and learning Japanese, mm -hmm. they never had any. Right. So you just had to come up with your own. So anyway, I taught for must have been 10 years at the University of Hawaii. Nice. Um, <laughs> as a grad assistant, as a lecturer. And you know, then when I graduated, I, I came here. Mm -hmm. so, so how many years have you been here? Seven. Seven years. Yeah, seven yeah. years. So tell me about some of those strategies. What did you learn as a non-native speaker of Japanese that you can now share with your students? What are some of those strategies? I have a strategy for almost everything I teach. So I rarely ever walk into the classroom without having some idea of how to teach this and, and some sort of mnemonic device or song or little you know trick or tip or whatever. Um, the thing that I've learned over the years, and I'll, I'll share like some very specific ones, is that the more preposterous they are, the more <laughs> humorous, um, you know, or just ridiculous, they tend to remember them better. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I teach is second semester we have, so we learn the request form in Japanese, mm -hmm. which is a conjugation of a verb, right? So it's called the te form. And there is a te form song. So in Japanese, there are several endings to verbs. And in order to conjugate all of those verbs into the te form, there is a particular song that covers the most difficult part of that, yeah. right? So I'll stand up in front of the class and I'll sing this tape form song, which is to the tune of Oh My Darling, <laughs> right? right? So students love it. I will not it. currently ask you to do this on camera. I will not right, make you right. do that. OK, but. good. Um, so, but you know, by the end of, you know, say, two weeks later, all the students know it. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of nice because it is you know, you drop this ending, you add that ending, and that's how that song works. Uh -huh. But it's almost like when you were a kid and you learned the ABCs, you right. know, and you didn't know what came after F, and mm -hmm. so you went A, B, C, D, E, F, yeah. right? You stopped right there. Yeah. So I literally, when I'm walking through the classroom, and I'm checking on, say, pair work or something like that, we're doing some tape form work. I will hear students go, right, until they get to the verb that they actually, you know, yeah. that's what they're looking for. Yeah. And so I know that it works, which is kind of cool. That's great. Um, other ones that tend to stick, certain strategies would be um, things that are not very PC, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know if I can even share those things right sure. now. Okay. 
it's, it, it includes using a bad word. Right. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so for example, when you learn the verb to know in Japanese that has particular conjugations. Mm -hmm. So the first conjugation, if you know something, is shiteimasu. Right, which is in what we call the teimas form. Mm -hmm. However, the opposite, the negative is not no, is shirimasen, which is a different conjugation. Okay. So, can you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> okay, so I say, shiteimas, I know. Shirimasen, I don't know. And the mnemonic for that is then, it's shitty that I don't know. Right. And that's just to remind students that it's not shiteimas and shirimasen. Right. Which would sort of be the opposite of the, I don't know if this makes any sense to anybody who's listening. But, um, <laughs> anyway, um, so other examples would include, so Japanese has three different orthographies, right? Two native syllabaries, which are sort of like alphabets, but okay. they're, they're syllabic. So you'd have kaki, kukeko, sashi, suse, so, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So one of the hardest parts about learning Japanese is learning the writing system. Yeah. And you can't, native speakers will, they have learned through a rote memorization process. Just like we do with ABC, you go through and you just write A, mm -hmm, B, C, mm -hmm. and you write it over and over and over again, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't really work with adult learners of a logographic language like Japanese, or say Chinese, mm -hmm. or maybe even Thai. So what you have to do is come up with all of these different sort of strategies, you know, all the little components of, of the character and try to figure out, is there a way that I can help them remember this? Mm -hmm. And so there are a couple different things I use. And one of them is that we'll break down, you know, the character as if it's a picture. Okay. Okay. And kanji also has something like radicals. So a particular portion of that kanji will have a radical that represents a particular meaning or a particular object, wow. right? So, I mean, it's, it's difficult without actually right. showing you, but for example, the kanji for new in Japanese is formed with, and I'm gonna draw on the air because this is what you do if you do <laughs> Japanese, is tatsu, which means to stand, mm -hmm. right? Underneath that is the radical for tree, okay? And then to the right of that, you have something that looks like a weird looking K. Hmm. Right? So what we came up with for new, atarashi, is standing on a tree looking at the new Kmart, <laughs> which gives you all of the different yeah. portions so that you remember it, and then the fact that it means new. Right. Right. So stuff like that. So these are things that I have come up with myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. Other times I'll open up to the class and I'll say, you know what, this is a really hard kanji. How are we going to remember this? Does right. anybody have a strategy? And you know, you have one or two students in class who are from, you know, fine arts mm -hmm. or whatever, or maybe they're new media and they're really interested in this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they'll come up with something really funny, really amazing. And then, you know, I'll write it down and I'll make sure that the next time we do that, I'll say, this is what the students came up with in the last class. Right. And we might That's use great. it, I might use it for the whole thing and people, mm -hmm. you know, or for the next class, someone say, yeah, but that kind of looks like this, right? Right, And this seems like a really good way to remember, then we might switch it. So it just kind of depends on the class. Yeah. So I'm not even sure what the original question was <laughs> when we go. Some of the different ways that you help your students learn um, because you had to come to the language as, a, as an outsider as well. A really interesting theme that I'm hearing is a lot of this is about um, confidence in that these students, for the most part, you've got students who were not themselves Japanese speakers, obviously coming to your classroom to learn it, mm -hmm. but it's a radically different language and a radically different script. So a lot of these strategies you're talking about, it's also partly about putting them a bit at ease, helping them relax, the song, right. the pictures. Yep, making it easier. Right. Um, I have never seen a textbook in Japanese that actually explains things to the level that I would prefer it, hmm. right? So a lot of times they'll sort of delve into somewhere in the middle, but not give you the big picture. Right. You know, give you the details, but not tell you how they got there. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I think that I'm, I'm fairly good at as a teacher is really giving students the big picture. This is where this fits in this whole right. thing. Right. And then also then breaking it down mm -hmm. and saying, this is how we can better understand this. Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of seems like it's very, you know, if I look at the way I teach grammar, that's the way I do that. Um, and then there are lots of things about language that are very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So think of grammar as sort of mathematical equations. You know, mm -hmm. it can be broken down. It can, and 
you know, Japanese is very systematic that way. Not like English, where mm -hmm. of course you learn the spelling <laughs> rules and there are no real spelling rules and that sort of thing. Um, Japanese is very systematic. The only part that's not systematic is when you actually have to speak to a native speaker, hmm. right? So I mean, you can have all the grammar knowledge in the world, know all your vocab, but interacting in a second language is, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. very different, mm -hmm. right? So that's the other part that I really have to explain to students. Mm -hmm. You know, so an example would be something like second, second or third chapter, we do invitations. Right? And it happens to be essentially that you invite people in Japanese using the negative form of the verb. Hmm. Right? So won't you go to the party with me on Saturday? Okay. That sort of thing, right? right? So the book will introduce that and will be, you know, inviting people left and right to do this and that. But then students will inevitably say, well, how do I even respond to this? Right? Because that's not, the book doesn't actually take that next hmm. step. Mm -hmm. um, because that's very, sociolinguistic, right. pragmatic. Right. How do you refuse an invitation? How do you accept an invitation? So we spend an entire class period sometimes uh, learning how to refuse uh, invitations. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember this one student saying, you know, like, Sensei, we've been doing this. You know, would you like to come to the party with me? Would you like to go to the movie with me on Friday? And we've all been rejected in this <laughs> really depressing class. You know, but part of it is is that Japanese don't outright reject things, hmm. right? So they so don't say something like, um, "No, I won't go to the party with you." And of course, we don't do that in English either, right? Oh, you know, I'm really busy on Saturday, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea that Japanese people don't say no is actually quite true hmm. on one hand. They don't specifically say no in the sense that they won't say ie, which is the word for no in Japanese, mm -hmm. um, in this situation in, in any case. Mm -hmm. um, but what they will do is give you subtle signs that that's not going to work for them. Mm -hmm. So we practice doing um, sucking air through our teeth which is sort of an indication that, oh, you know, right. I don't think I could do that. You know, it's a hesitation thing. Um, tilting the head off to the side when you do that, you know, doing this. <laughs> yeah. And I explain to the students then that that means no, mm -hmm. right? If you see any sort of hesitation, you walk into a gallery and you say, can I take pictures? And the security guard goes, that doesn't mean maybe. Right. And that doesn't mean, yeah, maybe I guess you can. That actually mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. it's a loud no in Japanese. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> there are lots of things, you know, you start with the nitty-gritty grammar points, and then you get to the point where maybe you can conjugate the verb in the proper way, and then you get to the point where maybe you can make a sentence, but then that has to actually equal some sort of interaction. Right. And it has to be socially appropriate. Right. Um, because so many things about Japanese are almost exact opposite of English, hmm. and they're not very direct, that sort of thing. Yeah. So lots of little things you have to teach. And it's another little things and big things, really, isn't it? Because in, you're teaching a language, but of course that you're teaching a worldview into another culture, right? right? You cannot right. the examples you were just giving me. You cannot divorce grammar uh, and verb conjugations from cultural norms, from how to interact appropriately. You're not just teaching a language. No, and in fact, I tell students you can be perfectly grammatically correct mm -hmm. and be sociolinguistically appropriate and offend everybody. <laughs> Right, so I so would no rather. When you're teaching right, that. <laughs> I would rather be that they be sociolinguistically appropriate. Right, and maybe mess up their language a little bit. Right, you know, but obviously then not offend people around them. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of a balance, actually. If they're going to be understood, they have to know what they're saying. Yeah, but they also have to be acceptable in the way they say it. Yeah. You had mentioned something earlier about uh, the similarity to mathematical formulas. I have been thinking, in a way, as teaching challenges, um, the folks in the, who teach languages and the ones who teach natural sciences have a lot of very similar teaching challenges in that you've got a bunch of oh, content yeah. that has to be memorized. It simply does have to be memorized. It has to be memorized. And there's memorized. a lot of it. Yep. But your challenge is, how do you make that straight up content memorization yeah. engaging, active, interactive? There's some really interesting parallels between those kinds of teaching challenges, aren't there? Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to smile like that. But, <laughs> well, I read a book, it was called Walking with Einstein, and it's all about memory and sort of the nature of memory and mm -hmm. how people you know, memorize things. And it was really um, 
illuminating in the sense that there was some very specific, there's some very specific research about what um, helps people memorize things. Yeah. I would recommend that book to any teacher who teaches things that need to be memorized right. rotely. And one of the things is that if it's sexual, if it's uh, funny, if it's preposterous, mm -hmm. and if it's you know, absurd. So all of those things sort of right. combined. I don't really encourage the sexual aspect in my class because I think that <laughs> could sort of go awry. Um, yes. But yeah, I, you know, the point that you're making really then is that how do we actually teach something that is so dry mm -hmm. and make it interesting for students? And that's kind of, like you said, something that all teachers, but mostly like science and mm -hmm. language and that sort of thing actually have to overcome. And I guess I do it in a very, and how can I say this? Now I'm faltering. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're clearly effective yeah. at it because this is why your students nominated you for the award. I think so. Right? Yeah. What other factors do you think um, led your students to want to nominate you for that award? I think that's it. I just break things down so that it's easy to remember. And, right. and I think where s students have come into my class and they've had other teachers, um, typically native teachers, mm -hmm. and not known certain things, or you know, perhaps had practiced it and kind of gotten used to it, but then couldn't move any further because they didn't understand it, mm -hmm. really. And if you don't have that sort of underlying foundation of understanding something, right. you can't go very far with it. You can only do rote memorization so far, right? right. Um, and I, I think that, especially the students who nominated me, they really appreciated that about my class is that mm -hmm. they had learned something before, but they realized they'd really only learned about 30% of it. Mm -hmm. And I was able to give them the extra 70%. Mm -hmm. And I remember particularly with that, those students um, coming around and them saying, I just really have never gotten this. And I spent a couple of minutes just explaining it to them. And they'd say, wow, really? That's how that works? <laughs> right? And I'd say, yeah, it's not that hard. Yeah. Right? And then to see them then, um, in the next classes or subsequent classes, making that much more progress because they they got it. Right. Right. So yeah. I think that's part of it. And then the other thing is, I just try to make my class really fun and interactive. In what ways? I do a lot of silly stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, but in the name of pedagogy, of right? Of course. Nothing <laughs> too ridiculous. Um, but I, you know, one of the things that I found about my class that. Um, and maybe this is true for obviously like French and Spanish, you have to do a lot of pair work, a lot of group work, mm -hmm. um, because ultimately what you want to learn is how to speak to someone else, right? So we do a lot of group work and I'll do things like drills where I have half the class stand up in the back row and half the class stand up, you know, facing them. And, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll do the same dialogue and we'll do role plays and stuff and then I'll have everybody switch. So mm -hmm. the bottom row then, you know, one person goes over here and they all switch down. So right. everybody gets to talk to everybody in class. And I think that makes a really cohesive class. Um, students enjoy coming to class because they know everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I try to lower the effective filter in my class. So Meaning that it, what? Um, so if people make mistakes, it's not a big deal. Right. Right? I mean, there's still some sort of correction going on, but if somebody makes mistakes, nobody makes fun of anybody else. Oh, good. Right. And, yeah. And I'm always sort of respectful of the fact that it's hard. And if you have a student who makes mistakes and they get the feeling that they're being, you know, judged for it, mm -hmm. they're going to they're gonna shut down. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. They're not able to learn as much. So as much as I can, we have fun with it. Um, we're patient, I'm patient, mm -hmm. um, and we just work really hard at it. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like maybe the rest of us have a lot to learn from creating that kind of environment, whether it's current conversations about how do you deal with the more quiet students if it's discussion-based, or how do you deal with, you know, in the humanities and social sciences, conversations around trigger warnings. It sounds like you've really succeeded in making this very safe, comfortable space, because languages are terrifying. As someone who's it's, sort of tried to learn yeah, you know, bits and pieces, terrifying. it's terrifying to open yeah. your mouth in another language yeah. knowing you sound horrible and probably don't have it right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. So you've mentioned you know, it's very fun, it's very safe, it's kind of very non-judgmental. How else do you approach that as a teacher, say when it does come to assessment strategies? 
right? Sooner or later, you are, in fact, the person putting a grade on that work. How do you still maintain that sense of safety and comfort for them when yeah. there are assessments at the end? Have you changed how you assess your students over yeah. the years? Yeah. Um, I do lots of different types of assessment. Okay. Obviously, I do traditional pen and paper, but I also, for every chapter, I'll do an oral Right. And oh, so great. sometimes those orals are, you know, stand up and introduce yourself to the class. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, um, you know, pair work where you have to then introduce yourself to each other and ask mm -hmm. a bunch of questions. And so there are certain guidelines for that. Right. Ones where it's myself and the student and, you know, I'm doing some sort of task with them. I'm mm -hmm. the teacher. They have to call up and make some sort of appointment with me. Um, but. Of course, pen and paper is the easiest here. It's just a discrete point, you know, mm -hmm. and you just mark mm -hmm. it. But the oral exams are, you know, people are nervous. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. So, again, we try to make it fun. And one of the things I learned, this is funny, because my daughters were in Kiwanis this past year. And they had an adjudicator who I thought was just wonderful. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I got to go and see that because she would say, you know, my daughter's brand new with speech and drama is what she was in. And how did she get up and do all this? It's just clearly nervous mm -hmm. about things. And the adjudicator would come up and she would, she would do this after everybody had finished. Mm -hmm. And she would say, so-and-so, you were brilliant. I loved this, 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 and this about that. And if you want to kick it up one more notch, I would like to hear your voice a little louder, and you would just go through the roof. And she would say that to every you know, every kid, so yeah. every kid felt like they just did the best. Right. And then this is what you need to do to improve, mm -hmm. right? And so I think I used to be rather harsh on judging the orals, you know, and I'd say, okay, and I'd go through all the mistakes. Right. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. I, and then I'd say, okay, but you were a very good influencer or whatever. Yeah. And now I sort of approach it the same way she did because I could see the way the students reacted to her. Mm -hmm. They just immediately sort of like sat up straighter and mm -hmm. said, you know, I did a really good job. Mm -hmm. And that motivated them to be better yeah. and improve on that aspect that she had pointed out. Um, but I think had she approached it in the sense of, you know, oh, I noticed I didn't really hear you that well and sort of, you know, said everything fairly negative first mm -hmm. and then kind of ended it. But you really did a good job. <laughs> we don't yeah. hear that yeah. at the end, right? Yeah. So uh, for the past year then, I have been really trying that. And, and you know, not that I have um, made people cry in the past or anything <laughs> like that. That's not the case. Um, I have but always been fairly there's subtle differences, aren't there, in how you give feedback. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, That's something I'm still working on. I think I still tend to be too matter of fact, and I'm trying hard to think about lead with the positive, make a big deal out of the positive, and then kind of slip in the gentle suggestions at the end or something. Right, in a positive way, in and a saying, positive you know way. what, if, yeah. if you run, really want to get that A next time, this is, I think, what you can do, and I, I think that's within your grasp, mm -hmm. is what her tone was about all right, the time. It was, right. you're yeah. almost there, you're just at the cusp, yeah. and I find that you know, especially last semester, I did this quite a bit, um, that students actually then improved on that aspect. Hmm. So, you know, seeing students perhaps who, whose, fluency were, whose fluency was not as good, um, saying, you know, and if you really want to kick that up to an A, mm -hmm. then I think what you can do is just say those faster. You're saying it perfectly fine. If you just say it a little bit faster, hmm. that fluency will get you that A next time. Right. Right? So. Yeah. I think they really appreciated that style of assessment. Yeah, and it paid off. Yeah. What other new things have you tried recently that have worked? So you've already talked about um, just shifting that assessment a little bit, how you give mm -hmm. feedback, the order in which you give feedback. Yeah. Um, have you tried other things recently that have worked really well? Yeah, actually for, um, for my 2000 level class this past semester, one of the things that came out of the Teaching Development Fund, and I know you're going to ask that later, mm -hmm. but maybe I can sort of touch upon that now. <laughs> um, it was online reading, so essentially teaching the students digital, you know, literacies, okay. and going online. So it's extremely intimidating mm -hmm. to to go on the internet on a Japanese website because it's all yeah. kanji, yeah, right. And there are two thousand 
there are 2,000 characters that you need to know to be literate in Japanese. Wow. Right? That doesn't include the syllabaries. That's just the kanji. Right. Right. So students, by the time they get about to 2,000, they, they know about 300 kanji. Right? So it's a drop in the bucket compared <laughs> to what they need to know. So yeah. there are no holds barred when you go on to a website. Uh, that's in Japanese, right. and you've got kanji that you have never even seen before, and 90% of it is stuff you've never seen. Mm -hmm. So the only thing is, though, we're not exposed to kanji in our daily life. We don't live in Japan, right, or Hawaii, where they have kanji everywhere. Right. So you have to figure out some way to expose your students to lots of kanji in a context that they're interested in. Right, something that's a little bit more motivating. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've been trying is, how can I introduce online reading to my students. How can they become less intimidated by a particular um, website or just going on the internet and looking mm -hmm. up something in Japanese? And so one of the, you know, just as an example, uh, say you were going to Japan, you were going to Kyoto, and you wanted to go to a, um, a particular style of restaurant, like a really traditional Japanese style restaurant. Mm -hmm. How would you then look that up? I mean, of course you could look it up in English, right? <laughs> and you probably come up with some stuff, but you know how you want to do the things that the locals do? Mm -hmm. Like where do the Japanese people go mm -hmm. versus where do the foreigners go? So we go to tripadvisor.jp, the Japanese website for TripAdvisor. And so there is a schema that mm -hmm. they have, right? I know how this website is set up. This, you know, you enter your city, you enter the type of restaurant you're looking mm -hmm. for, you indicate what's in, in, in Japanese, I don't even know if they have this in the English version, what occasion. Like an anniversary or Is it a date? Is date? it, do you, oh, is it okay. a family okay. outing? Is it, I forget what else there was, but you know, they had different versions of right. that. And so, you know, students would go and they type in Kyoto, we're in Kyoto. And then of course there's the drop down menu. What kind of food do you want to eat? And then you have all these different Japanese words for you know, Chinese food and um, Italian food. And so they get to know all the vocab mm -hmm. associated with those things. And then, okay, what's the occasion? You know, just casual going out with a friend sort of thing. Um, and there's all this kanji pops up. And of course, they're just, <laughs> you know, um, almost freeze. But online dictionaries, I mean, we used to have these humongous dictionaries we bring to class, these kanji dictionaries, and we had to look them up by stroke order, by radical, it was just ridiculous. Wow. And nowadays, all you have to do is cut and paste, right? <laughs> so I'd say, okay, well, what does this kanji mean? This would be part of the exercises they would have to figure out what certain kanji mean. Right. And as intimidating as it was, students would go and they'd cut and paste and they'd say, oh, okay, that means this, right? right. And so it got to be to the point where I would then hear students later say, oh, you know, I went to Google uh, Maps Japan, and I was able to Google where I was going to go from Kyoto Station to um, Kinkakuji, mm -hmm. the Golden Pavilion, and I found out how to get there by train, and it was all in Japanese. Yeah. Right? That's and great. so, yeah. And, and so to actually have them do something really autonomous like that mm -hmm. outside of class, mm -hmm. I, then I, I really feel like I've sort of done my job. So mm -hmm. that was an activity that sort of um, helped them just get comfortable with the yeah. internet, get comfortable yeah. with reading unknown kanji, learning some new vocab. And so it was really pretty successful. Yeah. Um, how else have you been using new technologies in the classroom? I mean, that's an obvious one, that your students no longer need to carry around a big, heavy paper dictionary. Yeah. That's an obvious plus it's for you. Huge. Um, what other kinds of new tech things have you tried playing with in the world of language teachers? Right. Um, one of the sort of softwares, I guess it's free, that you can use is um, Hot Potatoes. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. <laughs> anyway, what it is is you can create tutorials on it. Oh, great. And it is an interactive program, mm -hmm. so you can do things like quizzes. Uh, normally what I would use it for is practicing a particular grammar point. You know? okay. So if it was, say, the Tay form, they would go through the tutorial first. Right. And then now that you know all of this stuff and you've read all this information, um, see if you can then answer these questions. Mm -hmm. How do you conjugate this verb into the Tay form, how would you say this, how would you say that? And then, of course, they type it in, and they would get feedback. Mm -hmm. 
as to whether it was correct or not. And if it wasn't correct, if I had anticipated a particular response, I yeah. could speak, you know, I could write little notes about that response. Well, oh, okay. this is what you're doing wrong here. Right. It's really difficult to anticipate every particular error that students might make, but for yeah. the most part, it's, it's pretty handy. Yeah. Um, other thing is I've been using, uh, students are so knowledgeable these days about mobile apps, mm -hmm. right? So I use Quizlet. I don't know if you've heard of that. Okay, so if I go in and I create a group of flashcards, mm -hmm. um, it, you can actually then listen to the flashcards on your app. Oh, so you can do great. it, you can go through it and you could say, you know, if, for example, we're doing requests, how would you say, uh, please shut the door? Okay, and so, and in the English side, you would, if you're listening to you, it's, you would hear the English and say, please shut the door. Mm -hmm. And then it would pause and you would, you know, preferably say it in your head or mm -hmm. out loud. And then you would flip it over and you'd listen to the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite nice. It's not, it doesn't sound as robotic as it might. Mm -hmm. So I was a little skeptical that it would work in Japanese, yeah. but it actually sounds very good. Mm -hmm. So we've been using a lot of Quizlet flashcards, you know, for vocab, for practice, and yeah. students love it. Yeah, and yeah. it's something easy they can do it's at really home. Easy. And there's a familiarity to the flashcard. I mean, even our students, you know, have some, I don't know if it's all just hardware. Right? We all have some sense of what a flashcard is. <laughs> yeah. Um, even, you know, if they're yeah. probably not still learning math that way or whatever in school. Yeah. So tell me more about your teaching development fund because it goes back to some of the comments you were making about yeah. um, how to get them um, trying different things and practicing different things. Yeah. So this was a teaching de development fund application you put in a few years ago. Yeah. Tell us about the project. So the idea was to create online reading activities. Um, so really the motivation for this comes from wanting to get students to be more literate on the internet in Japanese and just the exposure to Japanese. Um, the other thing was, I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> oh, okay, so we have a workbook. The workbook introduces all of the characters, right? right? And then, depending on what chapter it is, the readings revolve around the theme for that chapter. Mm -hmm. And the attempt then is to use all the kanji and use the theme and it all, all comes out being quite ridiculous. Okay. I mean, not really ridiculous, but, you know, sort of contrived. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so they're trying yeah. to avoid words the students don't know. They're trying to avoid kanji the students don't know. And so the whole point is they're forcibly putting in grammar points that mm -hmm, have been introduced mm -hmm. in that lesson. Right? Mm -hmm. So it all ends up being sort of gaijin Japanese, which means foreign Japanese. Mm -hmm. And um, they're not very interesting. They do challenge the students to a certain extent. They mm -hmm. test what they know. But uh, students are more interested in reading things that are authentic. Mm -hmm. Reading things that are, th that are authentic and timely, it's difficult, right? Because that means there will be kanji that students don't know, mm -hmm. right? Um, there will be words and grammar points that students have no idea what this means. Um, so what I attempted to do then is just like with the um, trip advisor mm -hmm. to go through and pick things that I thought, okay, students can do this. You know, it's sort of an I plus one strategy. This is something they, they kind of will be able to know how to do, but there also is the element of unknown and mm -hmm. it's above their level. Um, but they have the tools to complete it. Right. Right. They won't know how to read, you know, say the trip advisor review of the restaurant that mm -hmm. they chose. Right, but they do have the online dictionary that they can use. They can, they can try to use Google Translate. Often comes out <laughs> quite silly, um, you know. But a lot of times, in order to understand something, you don't necessarily have to know all of the grammar, right? Right. So the whole point of the Teaching Development Fund was to create, find these opportunities for students on the internet to do things that not only gave them an opportunity to practice their kanji and reading more but to give them sort of more authentic, interesting readings mm -hmm. above and beyond what they might see in their textbook mm -hmm. and be more comfortable navigating on the internet. So right. I made a bunch of uh, activities that basically addressed all of those issues. Yeah. And it was really fun. Students loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Because they feel material. like they're doing something real. Yeah. Right. They're not just reading some yeah. exercise in their textbook that they right. know is sort of manipulated just for their level. Yeah. Right. It's like the dick. Dick and Jane books. When, yeah. Right? <laughs> the students are like, mm -hmm. really? 
is this really mm -hmm. a book? Yeah. Right. So. And especially coming to a language as, as, say, for example, as an adult, you spend a lot of time practicing how to say, you know, you went for a walk with your cousin because you know the words like, you know, walk and cousin and right. buy a shirt or something or yeah. rooms in the house. And it is so artificial and contrived sometimes. Yeah. And students often will run across things that they've wanted to know for a while. And then they, they found it and they said, oh, this is how you say this. Or, you know, I've been hearing this in the manga that I watch or the anime that I watch all the time. Yeah. I run across this all the time. I had no idea to what it meant. And then I see it here and I'm able to look it up and, mm -hmm. and find out what it means. And oh, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's, it's real life stuff, you know. And you've built in a lot of flexibility too, right? Because it, it allows the students to have a few more choices in terms of the kinds of reading activities they want to follow online. Right. Um, so we did manga, um, which is, what do you call that in English? Graphic novels. Graphic novels, right? okay. Um, you know, and students, a lot of my students are really into manga, right? Um, we did Google Maps where we had to go from one place to another and we had to figure okay. out, you know, what are the directions we would get and what, mm -hmm. what do they all mean. Um, TripAdvisor, we did other stuff like blogs. <laughs> um, so we did lots of sort of internet genre type stuff yeah. just to see what we could come up with. Yeah. Self-introductions on... Mixi, which is a Japanese website, sort of like Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of different types of things. And hopefully then that covered the interests of the students yes. in class. Yeah. 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 So tell me some more about this other project you were working on, uh, this uh, uh, project with your students with the letter writing. Okay, so what it was was we exchanged letters with um, Itami Nishikoko, which is a little, it's a high school near Osaka in Japan. High school students and obviously then university students. Um, but it's kind of consistent in the sense that high school students would have a level of English mm -hmm. uh, similar to the ones of my first year students, <laughs> right? Okay. So, um, so what they had to do is, for example, my students wrote a self-introduction in Japanese, and that's the first chapter that we study. So right. they obviously they know how to do it. It's very formulaic, mm -hmm. right? Hi, my name is, mm -hmm. I'm a fourth year student at University of Lethbridge. I study such and such, right. you know, I'm from. BC, whatever it is, you know, nice to meet you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then they had to write uh, more of a natural self-introduction in English. Mm. So how would you actually do this, say, on, you know, Facebook or, mm -hmm. you know, how would you introduce yourself in English? Um, so they wrote that out and they included a picture of themselves and anything else they want to include, like their dog or their whole family or whatever. And we sent those over digitally. I scanned them in and sent them over to um, the Itami high school students. Mm -hmm. And so then they did something similar, which is they wrote a very formulaic, which is kind of the only way they knew how to write it, mm -hmm. introduction of themselves in, in English, uh, which sounded almost exactly like the Japanese version. My <laughs> students wrote, hi, my name is da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And then they wrote um, a very natural self-introduction in Japanese, something that they might write on a social website. Right. I, I'm really into such and such versus mm -hmm. my hobby is right. <laughs> such and such, right? So you'd get this, um, you know, obviously these sentences that my students had never heard before mm -hmm. because they, at this point, their level of Japanese is very beginner. Mm -hmm. And so we exchanged them and the students were really excited, you know, obviously because these are real people in real places. They're real Japanese people <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> And uh, the students on that side were very excited as well that they had kind of met somebody, um, you know, a pen pal. And then what my students had to do with the letter that they got, they actually had to read two letters, and if it, they were fairly short, they had to read three. They had to read the English version and give at least one or two sort of corrections. Hmm. Like, this is maybe a better way to say this. Right. Right. Maybe we wouldn't say... Um, I can't think of a good example right now, but something that sounds fairly unnatural in mm -hmm. English, and they would correct a sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so the students over there got feedback on their own English, right? And the, the teacher didn't touch him, and I didn't touch mine either, my students' right. um, self-introductions. Um, and then they had to read the Japanese version, and they had to kind of compare their own with the versions that their Japanese counterparts had written. Oh, cool. Right? So... Whereas a lot of students, you know, were taught in the first chapter to say something to the effect of, I'm a University of Lethbridge student, 
whereas the students over there had said something like, I commute, it's, it sounds a little funny to say this in English, but I go to or I commute to Itami Nishikoko, which is the name of the high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were using a whole different sort of verb structure mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so lots of things as well. So they had to go through and they had to, you know, the students were told to use kanji. Yeah. So they had to look up all the kanji. They had to make a list of all the vocab and all the, the grammar that they didn't understand. And they had to figure all of that out. And then they had to go back to their original self-introductions in Japanese and they had to incorporate some of the things that they learned to make it uh -huh. more natural. Yeah. So they could kind of see then how there was this disconnect between what was taught in the textbook mm -hmm. and how people actually would write it, mm -hmm. right? And so that sort of juxtaposition was really interesting for students. You know, we only know this one, um, you know, sentence pattern at this point. Mm -hmm. So we can only really say these things. But there is also, once we learn how to say something else, we can make it more natural. Yeah. Right? So it was really, uh, uh, they did a really great job. Yeah. And um, the students were really excited. It sounds like a great exercise. Yeah. And again, hitting a lot of different teaching goals. Um, you know, self-reflection, self-editing, practicing, you know, the translation and right. everything else, as well as that bigger sort of natural language, cultural goal. There's real Motivation, human beings right. in another country who's really going to read and talk back to you about yeah. this. So, yeah. yeah. It was really interesting. And, yeah. and just to go through all of the students' letters and see that they had really improved tenfold in terms of yeah. what they could say and how they could say it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question of motivation too. I mean, again, you know, I come back to the analogy sometimes of you guys working with languages, lots of content, natural sciences. But um, it, I think in any discipline, it's being able to make a genuine connection for them. Yeah. Why do you need to know any of this? Why would you want to learn Japanese if yeah. you weren't eventually going to, yeah. you know, want to speak to Japanese people? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. actually, a lot of my students' motivation tends to be. I want to read manga or I want to watch anime in Japanese right. or I want to do the video game in Japanese, right? Yeah. So sometimes yeah. it's not about interaction, yeah. but you know, it all pans out in the end. Whatever you yeah. learn can be applied in any situation. Yeah, yeah, and it gives them a reason and a real hook to hold on to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking about some of the some of these really interesting exercises and assessments and activities that you do in your classes. Um, Sometimes achieving that for an instructor means having to let go a lot of your own nervousness in class. Mm -hmm. It takes a certain bravery and confidence to let yourself be silly in class um, and take some of those risks. How do you think you got there? Because it isn't always easy when you're supposed to be the expert right. to let yourself also be the big goof in front of your class. How did you arrive there? Well, unfortunately, I'm sort of goofy anyway, <laughs> so it wasn't very, wasn't very high leap for me to take or long leap. Um, yeah, I tend to be sort of goofy, and at the same time, I can be really sort of drill sergeant like. <laughs> Maybe I'm schizophrenic. Which I don't might know. be more terrifying teaching Japanese. I right. don't know. <laughs> well, and the funny thing is that Japanese people often tend to be like that too. They sort of be, you know, they are really strict on one hand and perfectionist, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which I am. My kids would say that's the way I am. But then I'm also on the opposite side, extremely funny and sort of let loose quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. And they say that about Japanese, like in general cultures that tend to be sort of buttoned up very tightly, mm -hmm. tend to have ways um, to let loose that are kind of more extreme than cultures that are sort of somewhere in the middle. Right. Right. So you hear right. the stories about the Japanese businessmen and how, you know, sort of uptight yes. they are and very strict and perfectionist. Yes. And, but then you also hear about them singing karaoke in the bars when they're drunk with their clients. Right. You know, doing really stupid, right. silly stuff. Or the Japanese reality shows that sound much more right. terrifying the quiz shows. than, <laughs> right. you know, your average North American reality show might right. be. Right. So they do have ways to sort of let loose. And I, I think that just tends to be my personality. And maybe that's why I'm sort of um, have this affinity for Japanese right. culture because they tend to be, Right. I tend to be like that. So yeah. yeah. So you don't spend a lot of time worrying about, was I too goofy in class today? You're like, no, I was just goofy enough. Yeah. <laughs> I think it helps. I think a certain amount of goofiness, if you just let the students know that you don't take yourself very seriously. I think that's the key. Yeah. yeah. Then they sort of realize that it's okay. And you know, if I'm up there and I'm always serious about everything. I don't get the feedback that I want from mm -hmm. the students. They think that they, I'm mm -hmm. not approachable, especially in terms of I kind of 
we're doing kanji and I'll say, well, does anybody have an idea of how we can, you know, sort of figure out a strategy for this kanji or whatever? Nobody's going to raise their hand because, you know, mm -hmm. oftentimes they're kind of ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. and, and people will laugh good naturedly about things, but if it was too strict in class, I wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't get students thinking about it and offering their suggestions. It's so. a comfort level again, too. I mean, you know, the conversation we were having about yeah. you, you work really hard at finding lots of different ways to help your students feel comfortable and take the risks that are involved in learning a new language. Yeah. And it helps when you're modeling that for them. And you say you don't take yourself that seriously. I find it interesting that you, you can also use it as a window into a very specific kind of culture mm -hmm. that is very different than ours yeah. with a strict side and a goofy side. Yeah, sometimes people don't realize that about Japanese. They just sort of see the um, karate, mm -hmm. judo, mm -hmm. sort of traditional arts kind of side of Japanese. Mm -hmm. And then they don't realize if you go to Japan, especially Tokyo, you walk around and say Akihabara. And they've got the maid cafes. And everybody's dressed up. And they've got the cool gals with the weird hair and, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. And yeah. I mean, younger people, actually, they kind of know all a lot of that. But then there's also the side of people who came through the... Um, martial arts side, mm -hmm. and they're not as familiar with that. Right, right, so. right. The stereotype of the discipline. And, right. Yeah. 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 So we've already talked about things that you've tried that have worked well for you in class. Mm -hmm. um, do you have examples of things that you've tried that didn't work? Yes, <laughs> lots of things. <laughs> One that stands out that really doesn't work, and I. I would really like to figure it out. So if anybody sees this video and wants to let me know, <laughs> please do. I'm really not, I'm a very alternative kind of education person. Even at home, I'm trying to figure out ways that I can give my kids real life examples of real learning. Right. Because just the paper stuff in school just doesn't stick. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I don't appreciate about our system is the way we do assessments. Mm -hmm. Right, um, Kumon has a system that you, you know, you start at the bottom mm -hmm. and you sort of work it through and you master that level and once you get to a certain percentage of mastery, you move on to the next level. But if you don't reach that percentage of mastery, you take that test over and over and over again mm -hmm. to the point where, and it's not, you know, it, it's not a punishing sort of thing. It's like, okay, you know, you did the 80%, you're gonna do 90%, then you're gonna do whatever percent right. they require to get up to right. the next level. And I thought I would try something like that in my class, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so I said, what I really want is to see that people master something at an 80% level. Mm -hmm. I was kind of heading, I, I think that's fairly low. <laughs> um, you know, at least 80%, right. right? And so what I decided to do then was to allow students to take a test, like I would give these quizzes on, mm -hmm. have you mastered the tape form? Mm -hmm. Or have you mastered, um, conjugating adjectives, mm -hmm. something like that. And if they didn't get 80%, I'd allow them to take it over again. Hmm. Well, I ended up correcting a lot of tests, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and there was a certain group of students who would always get, you know, they would do it well the first time. But then there was a group of students um, who would not study that hard because they knew they were going to be able to take it again. And so there was sort of that initial push was gone, right. motivation to actually do well the first time. Right. And so I found that the students were getting lower grades than if I had originally said, this is your grade, it's going to stick, you don't get a second chance mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They were sort of, you know, so it sort of enabled them to hold off on studying at their best level. Mm -hmm. And that meant I had to do way more work. And so I had students taking tests three and four times. And then after halfway through the semester, I said, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. And th this is the same thing with a, a whole group of students in my class. Like, the whole class does really awful on a test. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, God, we can't move on to the next level until we get this down. Because everything in language and science, whatever, it builds on the level before, yeah, right? Yeah. And I thought, oh, gosh, I just have to do a retake of this test. Because people who did badly, they're just going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And I would do that, and they would do worse. <laughs> you know, if they got, a, say, 60% on the last test, they got a 55 on, you know, and I, I can't wrap my head around why that happens. Yeah. And I suppose there's something psychological about it that they think, you know, oh, she's just going to average the two scores, and yeah. I'll just do, I'll just try the second time, but I won't really study for it. Yeah. That's terrible. I'll never do re retakes again. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I can sympathize. I I do a, a built-in rewrite assignment, and I've, you know, and I've and I sort of had to work in. That there's grading, and there's reasons why they had to do both. There's been some interesting research showing that you know, uh, it doesn't do help. you? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, or do you in fact stop grading the first one to allow them? To, in this case, it's written work. It's not working with cumulative, you know, right. language acquisition skills. It's a slightly different sort of thing. But okay. um, because there's lots of research showing that allowing them to repeat, allowing them to redo and edit, is in fact a critical point of education. Right. But then, how do you get the buy-in at every step? How yes. do you how That's do you the get point. them to participate equally in each step of this revision process? Okay. Say. Um, it's a challenge. It's really difficult. Have you figured yeah. out anything that works? Yeah. Well, I've I've struggled with a couple different things. At the moment, I'm attaching grades to each one, so that they kind of have sure. to do it. And some of them are still kind of not super invested in the first one. But I thought, well, whatever. They still get the revise and resubmit. For me, it's working more on their writing skills. So that's a right. cute. That's a that's an ongoing process, you know. Okay. But, so on yeah. some level, that works. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I would probably have to think a little bit harder on how to get students to be committed to yeah. actually doing their best. Yeah. But it's funny when you have stage. this idea and you think this is going to be great, right? right? And it's I'm and then allowing it, and it my completely to master isn't, things. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you think I have very sound pedagogical reasons for this. There's this is absolutely going to work, and then it doesn't yep. work, and you're left a bit mystified. <laughs> yeah. Well, and part of it is that we just have certain limitations that we can't overcome. Mm -hmm. I don't have all that time to correct all those tests. Yeah. And the students yeah. don't really have time to study for. You know, if we have another test coming up and they're still studying for the previous test, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I wish I knew them. there was a magic answer, but I don't think there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Where do yeah. you want to go next then with your classes? So you've already, you're clearly really successful around, you know, lots of different ways of teaching your students. Um, clearly seen as a very effective teacher, hence the Student Union Award. Um, what new challenges would you like to set for yourself as a teacher? That's a good question, something I think about all the time. Um, one of the things that everybody complains about in any language class is that they never have enough time for practice. Right. Right, because you're in there and you're explaining, you know, the grammar point or whatever it is that you're learning that day, and then you, you know, that takes 20 minutes of the class. Mm -hmm. And then you have this much time to do sort of a rote kind of exercise. And then you have maybe this much time, um, 10 minutes towards the end, to actually put that in some sort of a dialogue. Right. I would like to do a flipped classroom okay. where everything that they need to learn uh, in terms of what we're going to do for that day, they actually watch it. And I know, his, I forget his name. Harold Jansen? Yeah, he yeah. did that. And I was really inspired by his talk mm -hmm. because he seemed to really, and, and he, he teaches statistics, is that right? Is it statistics uh, yeah, or math? He, yeah, political scientist, but he did it uh, for, as part of his stats okay. kind of methodology class. And I thought, because yeah. I've had stats, and stats <laughs> is awful. And to have that kind of practice, I couldn't imagine how much yeah. that improved his students' mm -hmm. um, grades in that class and just basic understanding of the material. Mm -hmm. And if I could get the videos up or whatever it is I need to have them do the stuff before class so that when they come in, we would do a little sort of catch up and maybe fill in some gaps here mm -hmm. and there that they may not have understood just because it's not going to be that interactive. And then move on to just practicing it the whole time and just yeah. speaking for most of the class. Yeah. That would be great because I think students would really, yeah. that, that would really be motivating as well. Yeah. yeah. What level classes do you teach and uh, at which ones can you see yourself maybe trying a flipped classroom style? Especially for the language classes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I teach all of the language classes, so 1,000 to 3,000 in one. Okay. Um, and then I teach a Japanese culture class. So that's t my lane 2850. We're changing it to a different number. But um, but it's a second year class. It's a second year class, currently. yeah. It'll be a third year class after oh, okay. this. Yeah. I think the flipped classroom will really only apply to the language classrooms at this mm -hmm. point. The, I mean, to a certain extent, the culture class is, I don't want to say it's flipped, really. They read the material ahead of time, obviously. Right. And then we come in and we discuss it. So really a lot of it's kind of flipped in that sense, mm -hmm. that they already have the knowledge before they walk in. And then we're just sort of working through it and mm -hmm. seeing what's relevant and, mm -hmm. and how to think of things and mm -hmm. you know perspectives and stuff. So yeah. yeah. Do you find yourself thinking, so you teach first, second, and third year classes. I know yeah. I have found that whenever I feel like really experimenting with something, I sort of start with the higher level classes and work down. Right. Partly because it's a smaller class, right? So it seems more That's manageable true. or it's more focused. So I, I usually 
try, worked out some idea or some concept at a third or even a second year class before I try springing it on a first year. Right. <laughs> Where do you think you'll begin with a flip class? Are you ready to tackle, I don't know, is it Japanese 1000 or do you think you'll practice? I think it would be easier to do 1000. Yeah? How yeah. come? Yeah. Well, obviously the stuff that's taught in that class, it's a lot easier than the 3000 right. level. Right. Plus it would really help me in class because I sometimes have 25 students per class for oh, the lower okay. levels. Oh, okay. Um, so to get them that material, if students have missed class, they can go back and they can yeah. watch it. Yeah. You know, lots yeah. of sort of time factors there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it would just be easier for me to translate what I know about 1,000 level stuff into videos, mm -hmm. you know. And plus there's a lot of stuff on the web as well that I could probably pull right. from. Right, yeah. And um, when you get up into the 3,001 3, level, there's not as much stuff. So oh, if, I was okay. if I were really interested in kind of using what's already there, mm -hmm. Um, 1,000 would be the easier level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 3,001 would be tricky. Yeah, and there's fewer preconceptions sometimes at first year, too. Um, uh, oh, of you, how you know, university yeah. level classes yeah. are taught. Yeah, you'll mm -hmm. hear from instructors sometimes, you know, about the resistance they face from, say, more upper level students when you try something right. new. Right, because they've and done I, it this way the whole yeah. time and they have a notion of yeah. how and it I should be. Yeah, and I find there's no resistance from first year students because they don't know what to expect in any way. Right. They're so you can kind of try anything they're fresh. You know, with them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Abigail. I really appreciate you coming thank to you talk for to me today. Thank you having me. It's fun having you.